Okay, so again, um, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the April meeting of the Beacon Historical Society. Didn't we get a fabulous April evening? It's a little chilly, but just so beautiful. The colors this year are fabulous, aren't they? Thank you for coming. I know you're going to enjoy tonight's program, but let us begin, as we always do, with a pledge to the flag of the United States of America. So please rise and join me in reciting our pledge. Now you may be seated, thank you. That was a little stretch break. Uh, let me just um, share with you a couple of announcements. If you have not yet had an opportunity to visit across the parking lot at our headquarters, the Eyes on History exhibit about the centennial a celebration commemoration of the White House News Photographers Association. Time is also fleeting. May 6th is the last day that you'll have an opportunity to see it. We're open on Thursdays from 10 to noon and Saturdays from 1 to 3. That exhibit is complemented by just delightful history, stories, photographs, information about the Van Tyne family. And so those of you who joined us last month know the significance of Harry Van Tyne. So come out and see the exhibit. And please join me in thanking the two women who did so much. You know, of course, Diane Lapis. Would you stand, Diane? Gave us our wonderful program. Did so much of the research on Harry Van Tyne's life, really, mostly beyond the borders of Beacon. And Diane Murphy, if you would stand, our, our vice president and, and director of our collections. There isn't anything in that three-story building that Diane Murphy can't lay her hands on in about three nanoseconds if you're looking for it. So uh, she just is invaluable to us. Diane, of course, is Bob's sister, and Bob is still the muse that keeps our historical society moving and doing so well. In addition to the uh, exhibit ending on May 6th, on that same date, we are about to have a really nice fundraiser down at the Reserva Wine Bar in the West End. And uh, it's going to be a nice night. The tickets are only $50. If you hurry up and after what day, Diane? Oh, after today, oh, tomorrow, they're going to go up to $55. So rush home tonight and buy one online. Save yourself $5. It's going to be a really nice event, and we're going to have representatives of the News Photographers Association there to talk about uh, the centennial history of that amazing organization that has witnessed and saved and documented for the rest of us the history of the White House and all of the important events that occur in and around Washington, D.C. And Harry Van Tyne was so critical to the formation of that organization. Also coming up the first weekend in June is our postcard and ephemera show right here in the St. Joachim's Hall. It's a fundraiser for us. It's just $4 to enter. Parking is free. We have refreshments. If you like ephemera, if you like postcards, please come down and join us and support us. We have uh, many dealers who come. We have items from our own collection that are duplicates that we sell. And so uh, we all are welcome, and please spread the word about it. Follow us on social media so you can see these posts, share them on your own pages, and we can widen the circle of people who appreciate the city of Beacon and its history. You're all going to be sick of hearing me say this, but you know, we drive down Main Street, and sometimes we roll our eyes when we see multi-story construction, and we lament how much our Beacon is changing. But the only way to make sure we keep our beacon is to support the Beacon Historical Society and to come out and to make sure that people understand what makes this such a very special place to live. So thank you for supporting our work. We're so grateful. I know you're going to enjoy tonight's program. Um, Dick Leahy, if you want to come forward, Dick. I've known Dick, I think, about 30 plus years, probably. He hasn't changed a bit. I assure you, I have changed a lot. Dick um, lives kind of around the, the horn from me up in Chelsea and is an avid collector of antique carriages and sleighs and is really a walking encyclopedia of information about them. I coerced him into coming tonight and telling us a little bit about some of the items in his collection, a history of, of sleighs and carriages, and he's going to also be able to touch on those two Main Street carriage manufacturers that we had right here in Madiwan and Fishkill Landing. So with that, um, welcome Dick. He's a, a former educator in the Wappinger School District. Spack and Kill, I'm sorry, that's, fear, that's rarefied air. He's in the Spack and Kill School District. And he surprised me because he's such a history buff that he told me the other day he was a math teacher. 
talented and gifted kids. Okay, yes. taught the talented and gifted kids. So if we have any tax questions, since we worked with the talented and gifted, we know you're the man to ask. So with that, please welcome Dick Leahy. Okay. Thank you, Denise. And it's nice to be here and share some of my information on my carriage collection. Probably been collecting maybe 50 plus years. Uh, most of the carriages I have are Hudson Valley carriages, not all, but most. And uh, it's been fun, I've met a lot of nice people. As a matter of fact, we're down in Pennsylvania, Denise and Chris were down there at the Leola Coat Shop. Uh, and Denise will tell you about that at the end of, of my presentation. Okay, so Denise set this whole thing up for me. I used to have slides. I've never used PowerPoint. So let's see. I'm going to interrupt him to say, I told him the hardest thing about this is what? Was that he had to find his slides because they were oh, in his yeah. barn or something, <laughs> and it took him a while to find his slides, and I converted them to PowerPoint. So this is brand new for Dick, and the, he's doing the, the maiden voyage of PowerPoint presentations. Okay, uh, the first slide here I put in because people say, well, where do you get these carriages? Where do you find them? And usually they're in an old barn or once in a while at an auction. Um, and this happens to be one I found a carriage up in Stanfordville in a barn. That's kind of the way you find a lot of them, stashed away with a lot of stuff thrown on top of them and all. But that's part of the uh, treasure hunting aspect of this and it's fun. I'm going to start, I'm going to run through a number of slides. I'm, I'm going to kind of just go over quickly the generic names of some of them. And if some have a history or human interest uh, little uh, curve to them, I'll talk about that. This is probably a most general looking carriage of the, uh, say, 1880, 1890. It's called a spring wagon. It's probably your typical family wagon. Uh, the back seat is removable and uh, you could put produce in there if you're going into town. If you want to take the family, it has four seats, and, it's, uh, and here's a, just a farm wagon. Probably every farm in the Hudson Valley had a wagon like this, farm strictly for uh, working around the farm, putting produce in, going to the market, or whatever. Now, this is the first slide that I have of a carriage actually made in Beacon, but I don't know who made it because it was in my neighbor's barn. Whoops. Okay, Denise. Uh, here, oh, man, you're right on. Right on. Gotcha. <laughs> um, this was in my neighbor's barn. I grew up next to the Irving Farm, John Irving's farm in Usonville. And when we were kids, we played in the barn. And in the back room of the barn was a carriage house, uh, or carriage room, really. And uh, this was always in there. And John told me that uh, it was made in Beacon but it doesn't have a tag, so we don't know actually who made it. Um, I'm just going by his word. However, uh, it's called a sidebar road wagon. Some people call it a doctor's buggy if you put the top up, and, uh, but it's not a doctor's buggy. And uh, the kind of the unique feature of this is that John told me that he and his father used to drive from Usonville to New York City in this buggy. A lot of these are just called buggies. And it would take them two days. Um, the first night they'd spend in Peekskill, and then they'd drive on from there, um, down the old Albany Post Road. And John left me this in his will, which was kind of nice. Now, it's little, some of these are going to be a little light because it's still light in here. But this is a little fancier version of a four-wheel buggy. And it was made by Brewster. And I'll be mentioning Brewster uh, tonight because Brewster was like the Cadillac of the carriage industry. You had the range from Sears Robux buggies to Brewster carriages. Um, Brewster was in New York City. Um, and probably you could buy a Brewster buggy. Well, let me go back. You could buy a Sears Robux buggy for maybe $45, $50, about 1890 A Brewster buggy, I have one. Uh, it was $450. So it was like a Ford and a Cadillac or Ford and Mercedes. Um, but this is a little fancier version. It's a drop front phaeton and there I am driving my horse on Old Angels Hill Road. I had a Morgan horse and, um, and I, had re I restored it myself. Uh, a lot of these carriages I did restore myself. A lot of them I like to keep in original condition and some of them I take to Pennsylvania to have them restored. Now, here's the first one that we have evidence of, you know, a beacon carriage maker. It's the John Sewell Fishgill Landing 
carriage shop. Um, and the interesting thing about this is that he says, our specialty this season is the Stivers Tilton, as you can read it down there, road wagon. And I have a Stivers Tilton road wagon. Now, whether it was made in his shop, I don't know. His tag isn't on it, but it says it was patented in 1881, second date 1885. And there's the Stivers Tilton road wagon. It would be kind of comparable with a sports car, sort of, as opposed to a sedan or a car of today. Now, there's another runabout, similar, cut under, that's the Brewster. And that's the one that cost $450. And I can give you the exact date here. Um, I think it was 1904. Uh, oh okay. Now, here's a carriage that I found in Newburgh, uh, made by the Newburgh Carriage Company. Actually, the tag on it said uh, the Fowler Carriage Company, and my grandmother's name was Fowler, came from the other side of the river. So I had to have that carriage, but I didn't know where it was because a friend of mine had found it, but he wasn't going to tell me unless I gave him the back seat off that carriage because it originally it had two seats just like that, spindle seats. So as you can see, I have the carriage, he has the seat. So, but it, it worked out okay. But it's the Newburgh Carriage Company. And when bicycles came into vogue, um, the Bailey Company in Massachusetts started to design carriages with pneumatic tires, blow up tires. Uh, so I did find one, uh, except uh, they're very expensive to get pneumatic tires. So these are hard rubber tires that are on that little runabout. Now this is a carriage, it would be um, down in front of Lindhurst and let me just get my notes here for Lindhurst. Franny Reese was responsible for me finding that carriage. Uh, it's a cut under basket phaeton and it's a fancy carriage that probably would have been used primarily to show horses uh, in the show ring. It has a folding groom seat behind so your driver would be in, called the whip, your driver would be in the front and your groom would be sitting in the back. And when you stop the carriage, he'd jump out and run up and hold the horse for you. Um, but it's a beautiful old basket phaeton. Now, here's a sidebar Surrey. Surreys are two-seated vehicles, seat four people, as opposed to a buggy, which is usually a single seat. Um, this one was made by V.P. Leroy, uh, or it came out of his carriage shop. I should mention that all these carriages you're going to see here were made in factories. They weren't just made by an old blacksmith in some carriage shop. However, uh, the carriage shops uh, probably took the different parts, bought the wheels, designed them for the person who might want to buy it. Like if you went into a, a car dealership and say, I want a, a black or two-door or whatever, uh, and they would you know, put that together for you. But all these are factory-made carriages. Um, as a matter of fact, the era of the horse and carriage in America is rather brief. Um, before the Civil War, the roads were pretty rough and you had freight wagons, you might have had stagecoaches, work wagons, farm wagons, but not too many light carriages, some, but only the very wealthy had those. After the Civil War, the roads became much better, McAdam roads and all, and the carriage business really took off at that point. So the, the era of the golden age of carriages in America would be from about Civil War or, uh, 1870s, 1880s, up to about 1910, and then cars came in. So it was rather a, a rather short period. So anyway, this is a sidebar Surrey, unrestored, and there it is restored. And uh, I think the last time I used that was a parade in Wappingers uh, with your uncle and his wife riding in that carriage. And he was what, town councilman or something at that time? Okay. Yeah, Bill Sidor. And I used to use it for weddings and parades, whatever. Hey, Denise, how come it's not moving? Oh, there it goes. Okay. Am I hitting the wrong button here? 
Okay, I want enter, right? There it is with a top. Um, now, everybody would look at that and say, oh, that's a Surrey with a fringe on top. Uh, however, that terminology never came about until the musical at Rodgers and Hammerstein's <laughs> Oklahoma. Uh, it wouldn't sound good to say a canopy top Surrey. So Surrey with a fringe on top, just a little more romanticized. However, the fringe does have a purpose, supposedly, to keep the flies away. I don't know if it really works, but that's the idea of the fringe. And there's another Surrey, uh, and that belonged to Father Divine. Uh, some of you may have heard of him. He was the black minister in the 1920s and 30s. He had a place in New York City, of course, and across the river in Ulster County. And this came from his estate. And uh, he was famous for his 25 cent chicken dinners. And an old friend of mine remembers going over to his place in Ulster County and getting a 25 cent chicken dinner. Now, if you remember Tucker's Buffalo Farm out in Stormville, some of you, some of these vehicles came from Charlie Tucker's place. That's one of his, and it's a rather fancy, of course, unrestored uh, carriage with an extension top. The top folds up and back according to the weather conditions, and it's got the original lamps. And here's another one um, that was, again, a natural wood uh, Surrey. Natural wood was used primarily in the country because it wouldn't show the dust and dirt as easily as a painted vehicle. Now, here's one from the Empire City Repository in New York City. A repository was like a um, used car lot, but in, inside. And uh, this was a New York City uh, carriage. And I bought it at Smith's auction, it looked like that, and then I restored it. And I used that for weddings, a lot of weddings at West Point for a number of years with my horse. Uh, there's the uh, carriage lamps on it, and get a little closer to look at the carriage lamps. These are candle burning lamps. Carriage lamps were usually either candle burning or oil burning, and um, they weren't like a headlight on a car. They didn't project the light out. They were used uh, primarily uh, just so you could see another person coming the road, down the road towards you. And here it is with the folding top. This carriage is a, it's called a do -si do trap. do -si do of course, meaning back to back. The seats, as you look at them there, um, you would have two people sitting forward and two sitting facing the back. However, the seats do flip around to allow four people to sit facing forward. But to get, you can't see it in that photo, but to get to the back seat, you have to get in the front pick up half of the front seat, flip it over, so you get to the back and then put the seat back down. And that's why it's called a trap, because you are literally trapped in that vehicle. And if you know, a horse got a little rambunctious or something, it would be very difficult to get out of there. This is a governess cart. The big estates usually had a governess cart where she would drive the kids around the estate. Uh, Alex Reese has their original uh, governor's cart, which I took to Pennsylvania and had restored for them. Um, and when the door is closed, well, can you go back one, Denise? Uh, the door handle, interestingly enough, when you, the door handle is real low, so the kids can't reach over and open it once they're in there. So you got a, a captive audience to drive the kids around. And Billy Jaycox, who grew up in Euseville, remembers Gabby, I think her name was, the uh, she was the governess for the Reese's and driving the kids up to Usonville to the store in a governess cart, pony governess cart. And this is a Meadowbrook cart, um, two-seated. Uh, it's a nice little versatile cart that I used a lot for picnic drives and, and sh once in a while showing. And again, it has lamps, and these are oil burning lamps. You can see the little canister in there. And I restored that one, and there I am driving it at a Wappingers Park show, probably back in the 1970s, with my Morgan horse. 
This is an Irish tub cart that was made in Dublin, uh, pony size, and it belonged to Arthur Godfrey. And anybody remember, I know you're all too young here, but <laughs> Carmel Quinn, anybody remember Carmel Quinn? She was the Irish singer. When she came uh, on stage, she came on stage, Godfrey had like a talent show in the 1950s on TV. She would come on stage in this, little, in this cart, actually. And um, my friend Dick Gladfelter trained horses for Godfrey, um, and mostly draft horses. And Godfrey gave him that cart, and then I ended up getting it from Dick. Now there's another pony vehicle, and it's a pony trap. And as I said before, you can seat in a trap four people facing forward, turn the seats around, and then they can sit back to back. Um, this, this little carriage I bought from a woman, Vivian Nixdorf, up in Big Indian, New York, probably 40 years ago. And she said her father bought it for her in 1912 and paid $325 for it. Now, this is my oldest vehicle. It's a four-wheel racing skeleton wagon that they used for harness racing on the tracks, probably Civil War, a little after the Civil War era. The old Courier and I prints you see, they usually have either high-wheel sulkies or occasionally these four-wheel racing sulkies. This was made in Wiesner's Carriage Shop in Usonville. Um, and uh, it was again at my neighbor's barn, in John Irvin's barn, and um, again the family gave it to me after John passed away. Now I just gave it to the Sportsman's Museum at Carnwath, if you're familiar with that one, uh, because they have golf, they have tennis, they have baseball, they have ice boating, but I, I said to um, Joey, who's the curator there, uh, you, you don't have the, one of the most popular sports in the last century in the early part of the 20th century, which was harness racing. So I'm in the process of setting up a display. Uh, so that'll show the oldest type of racing vehicle. And then I went over to the uh, Hall of Fame of the Trotter in Goshen, and they gave me a high wheel racing sulky, which will show the next stage of evolution of it. And then Coincidentally, when I was in Pennsylvania last week at the carriage auction, I found a modern two-wheel racing sulky, and I couldn't believe it was in perfect original condition. Uh, it had never been used. It must have just been used for display. So now we'll have the three vehicles there, and now i got to get a plastic horse or something to make it look a little more realistic. If anybody has a plastic horse, let me know. Now, this is a Brewster tea cart, uh, it would have been a, a carriage that you would have shown horses in a horse show. Uh, the driver would sit there uh, in the front with a lazy back in case he had a lady passenger next to him, and the seat in the back would be for two grooms, uh, and you would show your horses. This came from the Astor estate, and probably John Jacob Astor the fourth would have driven that carriage. Now he's the one that went down with the Titanic in 1912, and he was 48 years old at that time, so it's very likely that he would have driven that around the turn of the century. Now, this was in my neighbor's barn too, and it has two different names. He always called it a depot wagon, because they used it, the Irving family, just to go from Usonville, the farm, down to New Hamburg, pick up the relatives coming up on the train, drive them back up to the farm. So it was hardly ever used. They have the original lamps and all that go on it. It's also called a light curtain rockaway. And uh, it's in perfect condition. And uh, about 25 years ago, I guess it was, my friend Victor Schoen, um, he had a driving establishment out in Millbrook. And uh, he said, oh, can, we, can I borrow, he and his wife, can we borrow that carriage? They're making a movie for uh, Channel 13, Eugene O'Neill's Morning Becomes Electra, that series. Maybe some of you saw it way back. I said, I don't know, it's really uh, imperfect. Oh, we'll take good care of it. So anyway, it was fun. I went to Cornwall and watched them film and all. And uh, he said, we need it again down in uh, Saddle River, New Jersey. 
He said, I have to be at an old train station with my dog sitting on the seat and I have to pick up an old sea captain that's gonna come in on the train. Um, so uh, I wasn't, well, can you, thanks. To, well, you're right on the ball, thanks. <laughs> you know? um, anyway, I wasn't there for that, I was teaching. So um, then he came and told me, well, the train came in, must have blown the whistle or something, spooked the horse, but inst instead of the horse bolting ahead, probably Victor's fault, it backed up on the tracks so that the old locomotive drove into the back of the carriage, demolishing one back wheel, half the other back wheel. Luckily, nobody got hurt. And um, so I didn't see it for a year. He took it to uh, Boston. Bruce Tompkins built new wheels for it. And they are really beautifully done, and he did a great job. But Victor was in one day looking at the carriage, and I said, you remember what happened with that carriage, right, Victor? And his only comment was, yeah, it ruined my dog, traumatized him. I couldn't get him back in a carriage after that. So <laughs> anyway, now, now the carriage, the one you just saw before was very egalitarian. It's an American-style carriage, and it has that little roof that goes over the driver. So it was a carriage that you could have had a coachman driving if you were very wealthy, or you could have driven it yourself. But this is a brougham carriage, and these were always coachman driven. And they were of English design, but again, this is a Brewster. Uh, it belonged to Daniel Lamont. He was Secretary of War under Grover Cleveland. And you may have heard of the Altamont Estate in Millbrook. Um, and it's all original condition. It's a city vehicle, pretty much. Uh, they didn't use these in the country too much. And an interesting feature on this is the front wheels are narrower than the back wheels, so you can maneuver better in a city, uh, congested uh, roads of the city. Now here's one I got from the Warner family down in Cold Spring. Again, it's a brome, but it's a round front brome. It would have a jump seat on one part in the front so you could accommodate not just two, but possibly four passengers. Now, this is a sporting type vehicle, uh, again, made by Flandreau. It's called a four-wheel dog cart. And it's called that because you see the louvers on the side? The tailgate drops down, and if you were going hunting, like pheasant hunting or quail or something, you would put your dogs in and they would be able to get air. And then that truncated box on the top is called an imperial, and that's where you'd keep all your guns. And then you'd drive on out into the countryside uh, with whoever's going with you and, and hunt. And it's a, called four-wheel, uh, either a hunting wagon or a four-wheel dog cart. Now, this is a, you saw the little governor's cart before in the little pony tub cart. This is a horse size tub cart, which is a little unusual uh, in that there are very few of these. And again, it was made by Brewster and Company. And this belonged uh, to Reginald Vanderbilt. That would be Gloria Vanderbilt's father or Anderson Cooper's grandfather. So I have this, and I think he bought this in 1905 or six or something. Really not checking my notes here. Anyway, now here's my racing sulky. Um, I really didn't want to donate this one to Carnwath, the museum, because it could be one of a kind. It was made by Brewster, and uh, it's original condition, perfect original condition. And uh, the patent date, let me see if I can find this for you. The patent date on it, um, Too many notes here. Um, we're getting there. Okay. Uh, the patent date on it is 1877. And it was sold in 1884. A friend of mine found all this information in the New York Public Library. Um, and it was sold for the price of $125 in 1884. And he said to me, you know, if you were a school teacher in 1884, 
that might have been your yearly salary. So only someone very, very wealthy could have had that made by Brewster. And it's a wonder it stayed in such great shape because they're almost like pencil thin, the spokes, and they were used on the racetrack, racing together. If you caught two wheels from two different sulkies, there's probably splinters after that. But this one survived, and the last time it was used, uh, a friend of mine, she's passed away now, Hope Jones, uh, used it on the Danbury racetrack years ago. Now, when I bought this, I thought it was a doctor's buggy. I did put it in the auction. It was sold in Pennsylvania. Uh, I thought it was so unique um, with all these little compartments and all, but it's actually an embalmer's buggy. Somebody figured that out, uh, looked at all the little thing vials and stuff that were in there, and that's what it had to be. Again, this came from Tucker's Farm, not in that condition, of course. Uh, it, it was restored in Pennsylvania. It's a fruit peddler's wagon. And uh, right now it's in the Marshall Carriage Museum up in Conway, New Hampshire. Um, but they did a beautiful job of restoring it. Now we have some sleighs coming up here. Uh, first, I have a uh, Victorian sleighing robe, or it could have been a robe in for carriages, very decorative. Most of my robes for the sleighs that I have are either uh, bearskin, a lot of bearskin robes, they're fairly common. Uh, I have a wolf robe, and I also have a buffalo robe. And I've only found two buffalo robes ever. You'd think with all the buffaloes that were killed through the years, there'd be all kinds of buffalo robes someplace out there, but they're not. And this one came from Tommy Hilfiger's place. His wife was involved with carriages. Now, here's a Portland cutter. And a Portland cutter, there's two basic types of sleighs. Um, a Portland cutter has straight sides on it and a fairly roomy seat for two people. Uh, you'll see in a second an Albany cutter, which is a second design. This was in, again, my neighbor's barn, John Irvin's barn. And it's sort of local. It was Van Voris livery uh, was the tag that was on it. And that was in Wappinger's Falls. Denny, you ever hear of that? You have, okay. Denny's family, Denny's my second cousin. We go way, way back in Wappinger's. Uh, but uh, it was halfway down, mm, let's see, East Main Street behind where Shaker Travis and Quinn was and the quiet man. Uh, an interesting thing, the first slide you saw with that sort of a wreck of a, a, a carriage in that barn with all the stuff thrown on it, an old friend of mine found those carriages for me in Stanfordville, and he grew up in Arthursburg, and he said that when he was being born, he, he said, they sent for the doctor, and I think it was a Dr. Baxter in Wappinger's Falls, who went to the Van Voris livery stable, got a horse and a sleigh, could have been this sleigh, and drove out to Arthursburg um, to help with him the birth. And the next morning, it was so warm and uh, nice that all the snow melted, so he couldn't come back into Waffinger's in the horse and sleigh. He said they had, the doctor had to load the sleigh on the back of a wagon. I don't know how they got the horse back in, but I uh, thought it was kind of an interesting connection. Here's a little more stylish one. Uh, and Again, it's a Portland cutter, and it, it's from the uh, John Quartz estate in Kingston, New York. Uh, John Quartz was um, a U.S. senator, New York State senator, and uh, I bought it from his 93-year-old daughter years ago. But I also bought, I don't have a slide of it, um, I also bought a glass panel Rockaway, uh, which is a beautiful old carriage. And uh, it, it was in my barn up until just a few years ago, but um, my furnace went about four or five years ago. And uh, I needed, they came and they said, you need a new furnace. And I said, how much? They said, 6,000. And I said, okay. So the guy working on the furnace, uh, whoops, Denise, thank you. Uh, the guy working on the furnace happened to be the caretaker of the John Quartz estate in Kingston, a new owner, of course. 
And he, I showed him the carriages, and he said, oh, you know, the new owner would love to have that carriage, I'm sure. And I said, well, I don't really sell you know, the ones I really like and are unique, but I said, find out how much he'll pay for it. And he came back, can you guess? 6000 you're right. He, he said, $6,000. I said, sold. <laughs> and so, and um, because the main reason is it's back in the original carriage house, and that's where it should be, not in my barn. So anyway, now Brewster also made sleighs, and this is a very unpretentious, simple-looking little Brewster cutter, Portland cutter, again. And by the way, Port the Portland cutters originated in Portland, Maine, Peter Kimball uh, designed them, and James Gould uh, designed the Albany cutters, and you'll see one in a minute. Um, but here it is unrestored, and here it is after uh, it was restored by Paul down in uh, Pennsylvania. He's an Amish restorer, did a nice job. Now, this is one I bought over in Monroe Village, uh, Old Museum Village. They had an auction over there. Uh, a while back. Some of my carriages came from auctions. Um, and um, it's a racing cutter that Paul restored for me. Uh, very high, very light, and um, interesting story about that one. The carriages were, in the old sleighs and stuff, were sold in a field, and then they sold the rest of the stuff at the auction. So I bid on this and I got it. And it didn't look like that in the unrestored condition. And, uh, and then later, at the end of the day, I went, took my truck and drove down in the field to get it, and there was a guy driving out of the field with my sleigh on the back. And I said, oh, wait a minute, I think, oh, we must have mixed up the numbers, you know. But anyway, uh, I caught it. If, if I'd been three minutes later, I wouldn't have had the sleigh, so anyway. Now, here's an Albany cutter with very round, stylish lines to it, and this is original condition. Uh, the tag said Sporting Hills, Pennsylvania, I think, so it isn't a Hudson Valley sleigh. <clears throat> but um, people look at that and they say, well, what do you put that kind of upholstery on there for? But that's all original. That's the way they, they were upholstered years ago with that kind of floral design. And here's an unrestored one. It belonged to a Dr. Downer in Woodstock. And... Here's one that's sort of a hybrid, sort of an Albany cutter and also called an OG cutter because of the design on it. And there it is unrestored and there's how Paul restored it. He does beautiful work. Um, and uh, four of my sleighs were uh, rented from me for, from, for Warner Brothers movie uh, Winter's Tale. Anybody see that movie about five or six years ago? How many people saw it? Exactly. Nobody. Oh, you did see it? Oh, yeah, well, sort of my carriage was in it. Uh, it was a terrible movie, but no, maybe, did you like it, Nancy? <laughs> and anyway, they rented four of my sleighs, and we went down there. It was a cold winter night. Prospect Park in, in New York, and um, no snow, so they had to put down plastic and artificial snow. And they said, who wants to drive the first sleigh? And I said, I do. Uh, this guy, Rex Peterson, supplied the horses. So I drove the first sleigh down in front of this big building, a pavilion where they're having a big ball and people are dancing, and someone's supposed to come out and get in my sleigh. So I'm sitting there, I have my top hat on and my coachman's coat and everything, and. I sat there and sat there, and finally the director came out. And he goes, you know, it might look better if you weren't in the sleigh. So it was the beginning and the end of my movie career. <laughs> so, and said, but the sleigh is in the, <laughs> in the movie. I'm not. And there's another shot of it. And here's another Albany cutter that belonged to Dr. Losey in Red Hook. And he, it's a little hard to see, but there's a lazy back that he had put on there for making his rounds. And I had a, my sister-in-law brought a fellow in from uh, Woodland Pond who had just written a book on Upper Red Hook. And of all things, on the cover of the book is Dr. Losey driving his horse to this sleigh. Um, and it, it's kind of neat. 
Now here's another racing cutter, unrestored condition, but you can see how high it is. And it's got a double dash to keep the snow and ice from flying up when you're really moving around. I have some nice old photos down in the barn of uh, sleighs out on the Hudson River. Uh, they must have been having a sleigh rally or something there. And um, there were probably a half a dozen sleighs and probably 50, 60 people down around Cornwall. And that's before the ice cutters went through and cut all the ice up. And when the river used to freeze, that was going way back. Here's an interesting cutter in that it has a top. Most do not. It's a doctor's cutter. And again, it would give him more protection being out in the elements. And it has, you can't see it here, but it has a lamp bracket on one side. So it only had one lamp and it was on the, uh, the road side. And he could probably take that off when he had to go into a house or something. Uh, but <clears throat> a unique uh, sleigh. And this is a, um, uh, it's actually a four passenger sleigh, but I don't have a slide where it shows the other, I might here, of the other seat being flipped out. Now, here's your uh, carriage and sleigh manufacturing. Uh, the Jackson Sleigh Manufacturing Company on Main Street in Beacon. And um, Bob Murphy, who is your former president, uh, came down to see the carriages and he brought this uh, nice old photo down, gave me a copy of it. And then he gave me a photo of, um, this is General uh, Howland's estate, it's Tyaronda, is it called? And there's his coachman uh, with a four passenger Albany sleigh and a pair of horses, no snow when this was taken. But um, I believe I have that sleigh. Now I think, Denise, we have to jump, I'm gonna jump past the, in there. There it is in original condition and the tag on it says uh, Jackson and Davis, Matawan, New York not just Jackson. So uh, now Bob Murphy never heard of Jackson and Davis, but they must have been, there must have been a partnership there at one time. Um, because this is the only four passenger Albany sleigh that I've ever found in the Hudson Valley. So I'm pretty sure it could be that one. Um, and here it is restored. Paul did a nice job. He tried to duplicate all the original striping. Sleighs uh, were very decorative, uh, unlike carriages, which were ra rather subtle uh, in their design and coloration. But sleighs were, were different. They could be in all your old Courier and Ives prints that shows them with all the striping and all. And Denise is going to show you the one that you have now. Um, again, we just have a couple more here. That's a a utilitarian bobsled. And a bobsled is different than a regular cutter sleigh in that the front uh, bobs turn independent of the back. So it's much easier to turn on ice and snow. And there's a four passenger bobsleigh um, made by Studebaker. And there it is restored. And Studebaker was one of the only companies that sort of did a transition from carriage making and wagon making into automobiles. And uh, I had a Studebaker years ago. And this is one of my big heavy, they called them Hudson River sleighs because most of these big round bodied sleighs like this one were made from Ossining up to Albany. And uh, they were called Hudson Hudson Valley, Hudson River sleighs. It doesn't have a tag on it, so I don't know who made it. Now, I just put this old slide in here of sort of a wreck of a sleigh that I found. It had Newburgh Carriage Company on it, and a friend of mine took it. He lives in Maryland, and he did it over, and he did a, a great job rebuilding that sleigh. So now we're going to turn it over to Denise. Questions and your hearty round of applause. But um, what's what reconnected Dick and I was an opportunity to welcome back to Beacon after. Who was supposed to tell me to pick up the microphone? 
sorry. Uh, what con reconnected Dick and I after all these years was the fact that Diane Lapis, as our president last year, received an email inquiry from Locust Grove. Would we be interested in acquiring for our collection here at Beacon Historical a cutter sleigh, a small cutter sleigh that was believed to have been at Craig House Hospital? And Dr. Slocum, that some of you may know that I remember Jonathan Slocum was the son of Clarence Slocum, who was the original founder of Craig House Hospital. And Jonathan, the son, had given this sleigh to Boscobel. Boscobel, in turn, had given it to the Putnam County Historical Society. They had given it to Locust Grove, and it had sat in the Locust Grove carriage barn for years, decades, and it was um, just really deteriorating, and they didn't feel that it matched their collection or had any provenance with the Locust Grove site, and so they contacted Diane, and uh, we knew that we had a storage shed in which we could place it, that we could accept it, and we said, Hell yeah, we'll take it. And so after nearly 60, more than 60 years, our cutter sleigh is now back with us in Beacon. And just last week, my husband, Chris, and I drove it to Pennsylvania, uh, to Paul's shop in Leola, Pennsylvania, which Dick referred to. He's a carriage restoration specialist. He's uh, an Amish uh, workman. But I just wanted to show you this sleigh. And if you actually look, you'll see here, uh, this is Dick when we took delivery of it. Here's St. Joachim's. It's sitting on our porch. You can see it's quite small. Um, Dr. Slocum, it has some really neat artwork on it. Although that rabbit looks large, it's really probably only an inch and a half or two inches in size. But on the back of the carriage, on the reverse side of it, is this unbelievable um, piece of art. It's original. All of the finish, the paint finish on the carriage is original. And it is of a steam locomotive. And we believe, through what we know about the history of the sleigh, that Dr. Slocum probably acquired this sleigh while he had his original hospital, Fulkirk, down in southern Orange County, and he probably acquired it across the river where the steam engine had just really been uh, introduced. So working through one of Dick's contacts, Susan, is that right, was her name, we were able to date our sleigh to about 1850, so a very, very early sleigh in remarkable condition with its original paint finish, and we learned from Paul this past weekend he thinks that probably this yellow corduroy that was um, on it at one point may have been the original fabric. Um, this is all horse hair. It's pretty icky. Um, but uh, all of this came with us in the back of our truck last week, and we drove down to Pennsylvania with it. And here is, uh, is uh, Paul. Now, I want you to know that I asked permission of him. Would it be okay to take a photograph? And he said, yes, this is my business. Yes, you can. And so here he in, and here's Dick here. Dick was waiting for us because he was going to a show down there in Pennsylvania. Here we are unloading our Craig House cutter, my husband and I, my husband taking it off the truck. And here I am before we left with it in Beacon um, up at Hiddenbrook. So this is the last time it was in Beacon. Hopefully the next time it comes back, it will be um, beautifully restored. You can see it has beautiful beautiful ornamental detail on it. The original paint, can you imagine? All those moves sitting in barns or storage areas for 60 years used probably to pick up clients or patients for the Craig House at the train and bring them up here to the Craig House. All that use and it still has its original paint and finish. Here is uh, Paul looking at what was the cushion um, of it, and that's when he told us that he thinks it could very well have been the original um, upholstery material on there. So what are we having done? We're going to have it reupholstered because in its current state, the upholstery is just the loose horsehair and the cushion, although this looks not too bad. The other side of it is all ripped up and covered with what I presume to be, as an old house person, some raccoon poop underneath there. It's pretty messy underneath there. So this cannot stay. And he's going to restore it with historically accurate um, upholstery. And he is going to clean, clean the existing paint finish that's on this light. We won't be doing anything to it. We won't be changing it because it's remarkable that a sleigh from 1850 has this original finish on it with this detail. Um, it's really quite something to see. We expect to be able to pick it up at the end of the summer, and he's given us an estimate to do this work of about $1,000 to $1,500. So we can't do projects like this 
without the support of all of you who help us out financially. And so we're so grateful for what you're able to do uh, for us. So Gary, if we could turn up the house lights, um, there might be folks who have questions from Dick, for Dick, and I wanted to ask him to come back up and we're gonna share the mic back again to you, sir, because I'm sure there are some people who have questions. So anybody have hiding a carriage in their barn or their, their garage? How about questions and uh, the, the, there you go. Um, Anybody remember any of these uh, places or manufacturers that, that, that Dick was talking about? Any names sound familiar? Some of the buildings that I've seen were there when I moved into the city in the 60s. Yeah. yeah. So the Jackson Works, which you saw in the photograph there, that building is still there. It's right across the street from the Yankee Clipper Diner. So if you're having your breakfast, look out over, that's the Jackson Works. The gas station that's on the corner of Fishkill Avenue was the Jackson household. It was a beautiful old house that was torn down when the gas station was put in. And that was the family of, for some of you who may remember this name, Jack Stearns, who um, lived, owned Fred Analick's house, Sunnyfields, and ultimately ended up moving over to Connecticut. Um, Jack Stearns was the grandson of the Jackson Carriage Works manufacturer. So his name was Jackson Stearns for the Jackson Works. And then down further in the other end of town were the Sewell Works. And that building is also still there. As you're driving down, if you look, you'll see the archway is still quite visible where they would be driving the carriages in and out. Diane? That was her mother, right? His mother, Jack's mother, I think was Veda. Yeah, I think so. Jack that we knew, that we knew, right? Yeah, so, you know, I always say it. Everybody in Beacon is related somehow, are they not? Never make a disparaging comment about someone because they invariably end up being somehow related. Proof positive. Any other questions of Dick? Yes. So the question is about, was there suspension? Question. And I should have mentioned when I showed, thanks, Denise, um, the buckboard that came from uh, Newburgh, the one where the guy wanted the back seat, that one. Um, and that's called a buckboard. And the original buckboards were boards uh, on the front and back axle that just bucked up and down. And that was the suspension at that time and very crude. But uh, then, of course, they became very sophisticated after that. Yeah, there's um, elliptical springs. There's on many buckboards. By the way, the buckboard capital of the US was uh, Glens Falls, New York. They made the very top buckboards. And they said every millionaire usually had a buckboard in their carriage collection for when they went to the mountains. Uh, because they rode so nicely there. So they had longitudinal springs also on those buckboards. Any other questions? Yes. Good. That's a good question. I don't know. Um, well, um, I don't know. To tell you the truth, nobody's ever asked that question. But I guess you, you felt you could be more decorative and like on your sleigh that you have there. By the way, uh, Denise is going to make sure that the sleigh is preserved yeah. uh, and, and not just not restored, except for the upholstery and all. And it's, it's I kind of like to, if they're really in top original condition, keep them that way and preserve them. Um, Interestingly enough, someone mentioned about value and all. Uh, with the carriage people, actually restored carriages are worth more because they want to show them. They want to take them to shows. They don't want to, you know, partially preserve carriage that doesn't look that great. So the value, interestingly enough, is not what you'd find in regular antiques where they say, don't touch them, right? You want to keep them original. But why the sleighs were decorative as opposed to the carriages, good question. Um, and most of your carriages were, you know, painted, the ones that were painted were dark, blacks, might have had a small red stripe or something on them. Um, they, they were not colorful, except for those uh, market wagons you saw there and the fruit peddler's wagon. Um, commercial vehicles could be very decorative, but.
There, that's the answer. <laughs> You're right. I'm glad you came. <laughs> uh, any other questions? I just have a comment as far as the fire department goes. Okay. Back in 1886, when they built Tompkins Hall's firehouse. Start that, start that again. Back in 1886, when they built Tompkins Hall's firehouse, we were running with a horse and wagon. That's what we ran. Ben was the horse, okay? And they got him from the New York City Fire Department back, I think, in 1901. And until 1918, he was the fire protection in the city of Beacon. 1918, that's when they got a motorized vehicle. There's a lot of pictures of him, too. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Denny. Yeah, and interestingly enough, um, you didn't see it in these slides unless you look very closely, but a bridle, when you're driving a horse, you have a bridle that has blinkers on, so they can't see to the left or right. They're focused straight ahead, so nothing can scare them. So all your driving bridles have blinkers, or sometimes called winkers, except the uh, bridles that go on uh, fire apparatus. Some did, but most were open bridles. Um, and I don't know exactly why, but I guess you didn't want anything, all that noise and stuff behind them, they had to get used to that. And um, the, uh, also, if you want to see good examples of this, go up to Hudson, where they have the uh, Fireman's Museum, and they show where the horses would have been in a stall, and the harness would be hanging up above them. And all of a sudden, if they got the word they had to go out, the harness would come down, they could have that horse harnessed in less than a minute, and out they'd go. You know, so. Tompkins Hose was the only one that owned their own fire horse. The other ones had to be rented. When there was a fire, they had to go to a place and rent them to get the thing. That's, and Ben had his own stall. And it sounded like uh, it couldn't be in too much of a hurry to get to that fire. <laughs> Any other questions? And I also think, uh, doesn't Tom Consoles have an apparatus, a horse and apparatus out in the Ford Museum? Or isn't there, a, there's a piece of fire equipment from Beacon that's in a museum. I'll have to look that up. Yeah. Uh, that's my assignment after this. Um, and I should have mentioned to you, I, I noted that Paul, who is Amish there, is working on the carriage for us. I asked him, how many carriages do you do? Have, you know, how many carriages have you done? Mm, he was a man of few words. Mm. <laughs> and, I, and he said, well, he's, he's worked there since 1969, and he has owned the operation since, what did he say, Chris, like 1978 or something. And he said he does four to 500 Amish carriages a year. Because, of course, they're driving their carriages, and they have to be safe on the roadways. Um, but So he said... I said 10,000, he said more than that. So um, he's really very experienced and Dick, I think, showed some of his work, his restoration work here. So um, we're really fortunate that Dick opened that door for us. We're very grateful. Would you join me in thanking Dick for this great presentation tonight? We have a couple things for you. We're sending you home with a copy of the great book, Beacon's Memory Keeper and Storyteller, about Bob Murphy. This is 38 years of his newsletters. All kind of wagons in here. Thank you. Now I have two. Oh, you have another. <laughs> oh, okay. Have another. Okay, you do? Well, I'm I glad do. you have another. Right. I'm glad you yeah. had one. Okay, no, I'll give it to my brother. Excellent. Yes. Good, good, good. Christmas present. And then a couple of other things to surprise you. So put that down. Put that down. I'm very bossy. They know that already. Oh, Chris, you better get up here. Okay. Um, I hope this, this is from between 1946 and 1949. It was made by the Stanley Toy Company. Oh, my God. And it's a carriage and... You want to set it on the box? No, set it on the book. Okay. Um, it's a, it's a iron uh, little buggy that they have driving. I don't know what kind of buggy that is. But um, I was able, through the wonders of eBay, to purchase this for you. Um, the factory made them between 1946 and 1949. They had a fire in 1949, and so it's about 75 years old with its original patina oh, wow. on it. wow, this is great. So I've Thank been to you. your house, and I know you're Thank a collector. You. <laughs> yes, oh, okay, we got to keep these. And then, since you mentioned it, and I don't really know what these are, but I couldn't stop with one gift. Chris, take this here. 
put it somewhere. put it on the chair for me. Um, <gasps> it's heavy. It's wrought iron. It's really heavy. Um, you mentioned bridles and yes. Was, what's a bridle rosette? They go on each side of the bridle, one on each side. Well, I was able to purchase you online oh antique bridle rosettes of a, um, a man driving a horse-drawn carriage. They are beautiful. They Enjoy are. them. Think of us here in Beacon. Thank, Thank you very much. Oh, so you're very welcome. Very thoughtful gifts. Wow. Thank you. Okay, um, and you'll also never look at a movie the same way again when you see a historic film with carriages and sleighs in it because you understand now, you know, somebody like Dick, he, you're, you and your friend were invited to take part in the Gilded Age. Anybody watch that series? They filmed it up in Troy and they were looking for people to come up with their horses and carriages and you said? Well, maybe 20 years ago because it, it would be the whole month of August. They were going to pay me $265 a day and put me up and meals and friends of mine were doing it, but it was gonna be pretty much the whole month of August last year, and some of it was filmed down on Long Island also. But when I was at the auction uh, last uh, Friday, I ran into some people that were there and did it. Oh. And uh, a couple of young women that I was talking to, they did it, and they were showing me pictures, and I said, well, I didn't recognize you without your mustache. They oh. put mustaches on. They didn't have enough men to drive these carriages. Wow. So, um, but they said they had a great time, mm -hmm. and it was fun. And but, it's a lot of standing around and a lot of waiting, mm -hmm. you know. So, but. Yeah. yeah, but honest, you know, since I have met Dick, you know, now when you're looking at these historic films and you see it, uh, I know you want us to use the mic. We're done, Pete. I'm sorry. Uh, when you see the, um, you know, the carriages and sleighs, it, it's remarkable to know what goes into their restoration the research, and the real passion that people have. So thank you, Dick Leahy, for loving this chapter well, of history. We're very fortunate. You know, what I was going to say is, if you'd like to get a group together to come down and see the carriages, because the last time, I was just your board, right, that came Bob Murphy sure, and right? yeah. okay. board members. But, you know, if anybody else, if you want, because next, uh, next okay. Wednesday, okay, here we go. The, okay. uh, next Wednesday, there are some people, um, well, I'll back up. The Dutchess County Historical Society had an online auction of different sites people could go to, Mills Mansion, and they asked if I could put my carriages on that. And, uh, and I said, well, yeah, if they want to, you know, if they want to bid to come down and see the carriages. So about a few months ago, it was kind of cold. They didn't come then. They're coming this Wednesday. Um, I got an email that said a Mr. Linville had been the high bidder. So uh, I emailed back and I said, is this Mr. Robert Linville, the mathematician extraordinaire from Spackenkill High School? And it was Bob Linville and his wife Judy, and now they've rounded up 12 people that are coming. So they're coming Wednesday. So if you want to get together a group, you know, when, you know in the next couple of months, tell, come on tell down. Tell them about your barn and your carriage and how many carriages you have, your, your current collection now. And there's about 25 vehicles there. Some of them you saw tonight. I don't have, of course, all those. Uh, but um, it's, it's kind of a nice variety. And plus, I have a lot of accoutrements and all that go with it. So, as a, you know, not just seeing the carriages and sleighs, but other things, carriage lamps and uh, everything that went with the carriage industry. So one last question. How did this get started in you 50 years ago? What was it that started you down this path? Well... <laughs> I always wanted a horse. I was 14 years old. All my friends had horses. We all wanted to be cowboys. So I had saved up 100 bucks, and uh, my father said, well, we'll go. I saw a horse advertised at Bennett College, and he said, we'll go out and look at it, and, but we're not going to go all over looking at horses and stuff. You know, if you want it, we'll get it, and that's it. So we went out there, and they brought out this great big thoroughbred hunter, English-style horse. And I rode it around the indoor ring, and I said, I don't really want this horse, but I don't have a choice. We're not going to go look at any, and I had 100 bucks saved up. So I said, yeah, I'll take it. But if you find that, he said, I can't deliver it um, until next week. I said, well, if you find anything smaller in between. Well, in the meantime, an old guy by the name of Charlie Lang, he was always at Luther's Livestock Auction in Wasaic, and he would buy horses for the meat industry, dog meat and all. Well, evidently, he found this horse, brought it into Bennett. The guy at Bennett College bought it. So when I went out to see this other horse, because 
it was an, a six-year-old horse, and the other one was 13. But it was skin and bones, saddle sores, barbed wire cuts uh, standing there. So uh, I said, oh, that, uh, how much? 125. They wanted in the, because it's a young horse, so I said, I'll take it. So I remember getting it home, and all the kids in the neighborhood came to look at it, and it's, horses standing there like this, and they go, oh, he's really nice, <laughs> you know. So anyway, that's how I got, but within, I couldn't ride him. I didn't even know what I was doing. He would rear up and do everything. But after about a month, we had a meeting of the minds, and uh, I owned him until he was 35 years old. So he was a great horse. But how I got in with the carriages and driving, I had a girlfriend in high school, and we used to ride together, and she said to me one day, you know, my sister has a horse that drives, they said. I said, really? So we should drive the horse. So we didn't have anything. So I went and bought a $20 wagon that was sitting out in a field from a friend of mine over by Trap Rock. And her mother had a set of harness. So we put the harness on the horse, hooked up to this wagon, and off we rode, drove craziest thing I could have been killed because you know you don't know if the horse really drove or anything and it's nobody would do anything like that nowadays but that's how I got started wow. so anyway anyway well it's been fun chatting with you folks and hope you enjoyed it thank you thank you thank you Dick so much we're so grateful and um, before we close tonight I did just want to recognize somebody who's in the audience Bob Haight stand up so uh, this was a special week for Bob, and I'm going to bring the microphone over to him, and then we're going to find out why. What did you do this week? I went on the honor flight down to Washington, D.C. Isn't that great? So can you tell us a little bit about your service? I was in the Navy, 60 to 64. I uh, spent the first eight months down in, in Virginia, running through the swamps down there. They, I got chiggers. chiggers introduced to them. Then I was assigned to an aircraft carrier out of the uh, South China Seas. We were basically, station was in uh, San Diego, but we spent most of the time. And a problem with a carrier, aircraft carrier, it's sea duty all the time. I got married while I was in the Navy. I had a daughter. And once I got assigned to the ship, I did not see him for almost two and a half years because I was out, out to sea. Wow. Well, thank you for your service, and tell us your impression of the monuments. Oh, <clears throat> the monuments were, well, they're huge. The, uh, the wall, and they had a, a number of people alongside the wall. If you knew someone that was there, they would spot them for you, tell you where, where to go, and was really impressive to see all the names and all that. But I think one of the most impressive that I thought was the uh, Second World War Museum, and it was... Uh, by Mirror Lake, and you, you look down it, you can see the Washington Monument, and it was very, very nice. And the people, I'm walking, I'm walking along the path uh, alongside of uh, uh, Mirror Lake. A little boy comes up to me, about eight years old or so, grabs my hand and says, thank you for your service. Oh, if that really. <laughs> That's where we're gonna end our meeting tonight. So thank you everybody for being here. Thank you. Oh, did you? Okay, yeah, yeah.